Hey guys, so around the time of releasing my last video where I was discussing the first half of Castlevania 64, I actually did end up beating the game, so part two is officially happening right now. So let's talk about the rest of Castlevania 64 and how the game eventually did break me. So after we got the Nitro and beat the bull boss who turned into meat, you have a brief encounter again with Actrice. At least I think it's pronounced Actrice. The powerful vampire witch. Here, you have to fight your cousin, Camilla, who is now also a vampire. That part of the game isn't very interesting to me, so I'm just gonna gloss on over that. We're gonna go to the next part, the Tower of Science. Once you get off the elevator, you enter a place that almost feels like some gothic factory setting. You see lots of conveyor belts pushing out boxes covered in blood to show you that some other poor bastards before you totally got smooshed. I'm gonna go a bit off topic here, but like, why did this section even exist? Why did Dracula have this built? Is it intended to just be a messed up obstacle course for anyone who dares to challenge him? Or does it serve a purpose? Are we in a shipping facility? Like, what the hell is going on? Anyway, so this part has a lot of platforming along with boxes full of spikes and lasers to dodge. You do have to time your jumps during the parts with the lasers, which can take a little work to get a hang of but this part really isn't that hard. Just tedious, but easy enough to get through. Now in the second part of the Tower of Science, things get pretty annoying, but I will say that there is actually music here and it's a pretty good track. This part just does not feel like Castlevania to me. The minute you enter the room, you're met with a ridiculous amount of machine gun turret thingies and moving lasers that remind me of Light Crusader on the Sega Genesis. If you've played that game, I think you'll know what I mean. The weapons here just seem a little too technologically advanced, but then again, there's motorcycles in this game, so whatever. The cool part about this section are the monsters encased in what appears to be glass. Or maybe they are holograms. Either way, they look cool and it's like Dracula has a monster collection or something. Using Carrie here is pretty great because her homing energy bullet makes it easy to hide while taking out the turrets. However, there is one part where the camera angle automatically flips and wow is that disorienting. This is really where the camera angle issues truly begin to stand out for me, but it will get a lot worse. As expected, there is some tricky platforming here and a lot of doors to open. Sometimes the doors even open to a gun that shoots you directly in the face. I did get frustrated here, but it was nothing compared to what I was about to experience next in the Tower of Sorcery. There is just so much to say about this section of the game, I was a bit overwhelmed when writing this part because I didn't know exactly how to effectively explain why this is so goddamn shitty. I could almost make a video about this section alone because I can't remember the last time a game has driven me this insane. So when I first enter the Tower of Sorcery, I'm optimistic. A lot of it probably had to do with the relief of finally being in a different area of the game, but it was a totally different vibe from the previous levels. Although there are stained glass windows here and a hallway showing you you're still in the castle, at least I think we are, <laughs> it truly does feel like you're in space and walking on ice crystals. The sounds of the sparkling atmospherics give the level an ethereal vibe at first that gives you a false sense of optimism. Like, oh, this level might be awesome, but oh how very wrong I was. You start out by running down narrow platforms that look like ice but I'm going to guess they're just made out of crystals since they aren't slippery. Plus, crystals seem to fit better with the whole sorcery vibe. But when you actually have to start jumping from crystal to crystal, my optimism quickly began to fade and turn into confusion and pure rage. This is truly N64 platforming hell. The white snow cone looking crystals aren't too bad, and it really helps here that the jumping can sometimes be a bit forgiving in this game, as long as you're holding down A so your character can grab onto the ledge. It feels like the ledge magnetically pulls you to it, thankfully. The enemies in this stage are tiny, liquid looking monsters that seem harmless at first, but can really drive you insane, especially during one part which I'll get to in a minute. They take a ridiculous amount of hits and can easily push you off platforms, so they suck pretty hard. And they are the only enemies in this level. Well, other than the camera or the platforming. The first real camera obstacle here is when you're trying to ascend up a tower. You have to fiddle with the angles here so you can try your best to see where you need to jump. But it gets so much worse. Some magenta crystals disappear in a way that are similar to the disappearing blocks in Mega Man. 
At first, I thought these were gonna be the most annoying crystals to deal with, but they actually aren't that bad compared to the fuckery that's about to come next. You just have to get a hold of the pattern and try your best to judge how far you need to jump. And there aren't many save spots in this level either, so it gets pretty soul-crushing dying over and over and over again. There are some parts where after you land on a platform, it's hard to tell what direction you're supposed to go. Mostly because there are the same crystals all around you, and if you had an experience like I did, where you're dying multiple times, you start forgetting just where you are in the level. It sucks. Also, the graphics here make it really hard to know what you're looking at. I can't fucking see! What am I looking at here? No, 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 this way. At least I had trouble deciphering what exactly was a platform or where the edge of a crystal was. There's nothing like getting to the end of the stage only to misjudge your jump distance and fall into the bleak abyss. In hindsight, maybe this would have been fine for me to play back in the day, or even 15 years ago. I say that because the last time I played Goldeneye, for example, I could barely play it because I couldn't make out what the hell was going on. But, like, 15 years ago I was still able to play 4 player mode on a small screen just fine. So something switched in my head in the past few years where when it comes to the N64, I have a real hard time dealing with the graphics. But I digress. For most of this level, the main mechanic here is flipping switches. Which, by the way, didn't even look like switches! They are just floating crystal things that you whack until they break. Now that I think about it, that's pretty symbolic for the toll this level has taken on my brain. First of all, the switches are timed. There's no clock counting down your time or anything, you just have to figure it out. There should be an audible cue or something. You flip a switch so the platforms can move either up or down to allow you to go where you need to go next in the game. That should be simple enough, right? But because the graphics are so bad, it's hard to tell that that is the purpose of the stupid switches. Okay, and now I try to make the camera do what I want, and then I go up. No! At least I couldn't see at first that the platforms were moving at all. Was anyone else confused by this the first time they played it? Please let me know in the comments because I'm curious to hear what you guys think about this part. And before anyone gets on me about saying the graphics are bad, look. I think most of us can agree that the graphics from this era, especially on the Nintendo 64, did not age well. I mean, look at games from the 8-bit or 16-bit era. Those graphics are timeless and still used as a style today. Whereas the late 90s had us all in polygonal hell. So back to what I was saying. I just thought we were arbitrarily flipping switches because why not? Cryptic shit like that would be fitting for one of the less than stellar Castlevania games. I mean, does anybody remember the kneeling in Simon's Quest? Anyway, after you flip a switch, you have only so much time to make it to the next platform before it moves back to an unreachable position. This includes some backtracking with disappearing crystals, and that's not the worst of it. After flipping what I believe was the second switch in this section, you find yourself on a giant yellow jello mold with two snot monsters who will not back down. These guys take way too many hits than they should, plus if you use the holy water here, it is just way too long of a process. I'm sure it's because I suck, but I could not get the holy water to land where I wanted it to. I usually enjoy using holy water in Castlevania games, but in some games its reach is longer than others. Or it just kind of sucks like in this one. And I know it's technically possible to jump to the next platform and ignore the enemies, but for the life of me, I just could not get the camera to go where I wanted it to. The camera automatically fixates on the enemies closest to you. So when I wanted to run past them and just jump to the next platform, it was impossible because the camera kept pointing me back to the enemies, not allowing me to see where I'd like to jump. So that's why every single time I tried this part, I took the time to kill these two enemies first. It was ridiculous. I eventually tried just using the melee attack and slapping them in the face until they had enough and died. But of course, I got hit a bit during this process too. After, I don't know, maybe the tenth time of me doing this, slapping these little fuckers in the face until they died did become a bit therapeutic. But still. So by the time you finally kill these guys, you have to run back to the previous switch and flip it again because you've ran out of time. You know this by not being able to jump up to the next platform. 
After all of this, you jump on the giant jello mold, which has moved down, and then up to a shiny blue diamond. I died here once from falling onto the jello mold, and once from getting stuck inside of it. Am I dead? Where am I? Am I stuck? Oh, I was slowly sliding down the crevice. Here, the platforming really sucks. I had a hard time distinguishing just how far I had to jump between the diamonds. And then once on the diamonds, I couldn't make out how much of the surface there was to stand on. This was a bitch. This is where I broke. Usually, if I get real upset, I just slap my leg or something. But this time, I threw the freaking controller. No, you fucker! It's okay, it's okay. No! I don't think I've ever thrown a controller before. I'm sorry. I'm done. I'm done. I never do that shit, but this awakened such a deep rage inside of me that I thought I might cry. But hey, video games should make you have some type of emotional reaction, right? I mean, maybe not this strong of one, but still, it got a rise out of me. After that, you enter a barren room called the Room of Clocks where you see Actrice again. Here, she reveals she's killed her own child to get eternal life and tries to convince you one last time to join her and Dracula in their mission for world domination or something. She is one evil bitch, but I do like her staff. You finally fight her, and it is a bit tricky, but I managed not to die thanks to having a bunch of handy wall meat with me. She shoots magic at you that causes crystals to build on you, which of course hurts you despite them looking pretty. She protects herself by building crystals around her, which you need to shoot through first in order to then try and hit her. But if you charge your attack long enough, you can sometimes hit through the crystal and manage to hit her too all in one shot. Anyway, once you're done with that, it's clock tower time! Now if you've played any Castlevania games before, you know that the clock tower levels tend to be a bit tricky. This one is very tedious, but it's short, so I at least knew there was an end in sight. There are a lot of gears, and yes, even Medusa heads. But those weird electric ones like we saw in the beginning of the game when we were running up the stairs. I don't like them, but they are easier to deal with here than in the NES games. You have to do a lot of balancing here. If you fall off an axle, you better not fall between the gears because you will get ground up. There's actually a pretty violent death animation when this happens, which shocked me. I mean, it's not that intense, but for a Nintendo game from 1999, I was surprised. The camera angles here sure don't make things easier because they are fixed. This is really a headache when you're trying to jump from platform to platform and not fall into the gears. So all you can do is look around using the shoulder buttons preemptively and then try to remember the direction to jump, if that makes sense. In the next room, there are more gears, but this time there are also fire-breathing bone pillars! And some are even on the ceiling! That made me laugh and I have no idea why. Probably because I was way past delusional at this point in the game. The jumps are very tricky here and you need to be sure to grab all the keys to open the doors to the following sections. Luckily, there's a save after the first room, but not the second room, which is total bullshit. If anything, get rid of the save after the first room and put it after the second, since it's tougher. This big last room sucks. Badly. But there are two ways to go about this one, and I'll try to explain it the best I can. Give me a break guys, my brain is still recovering. You can go the long way, which means jumping across a lot of gears, or do what I eventually did, which is apparently a speedrunning technique. When you're on the top ledge, look down and see another ledge below you with a candle thing on it. Let yourself fall off to the left and make sure to grab onto the little ledge by holding A before you fall all the way down to the floor. That's because the key is there and you must get it in order to get out of here. This saves a lot of time and frustration and it actually wasn't that hard once I understood what to do. But that's the easy part. After you grab the key, you then go down to the floor before climbing all the way up a spinning pole to get to a save. Then, you find the door to open with your key and you're on your merry way. After all of this, you see your old pal Renan again. 
You know, the demon salesman with the creepy glasses? Well, since I did not spend over 30,000 gold pieces, I won't be seeing him again, and I won't have to fight him. The idea of having to fight a character because you bought too many things from him seems so weird to me. I mean, wouldn't he want us to buy things from him? Anyway, I looked it up and apparently this is explained in the first scroll we pick up in the game, but I don't remember that. There is another person we see again from our past, and that person is Vincent. The guy who claimed to be the superior vampire hunter. Well, he turned into a vampire and now we have to fight him. Or maybe he was a vampire all along? I'm not sure. Either way, it wasn't too hard of a fight and not really anything special. I knew he was going to be trouble. And then you meet a giant staircase. So you know what that means, it's Dracula time! The Dracula fight is interesting to say the least. It seems like they took the classic Castlevania Dracula fight, but just made it so you can explore it in a 3D room, which I don't totally hate. He shoots fire like usual, but also has some blasts of magic that have a decent range. He's not too bad to fight with the charge attack that Carrie has. So since I took too long to beat the game, I got the bad ending which means I didn't actually defeat Dracula. After you defeat him, or whatever you call it, when you get the bad ending, nothing is left but his cloak that slowly comes to the floor and combusts into flames. I thought there would be a second form, which usually happens with these games, but nope. Apparently that is also due to taking too long to finish the game, or else we would have fought a dragon and watched the castle crumble. Damn. Anyway, our friend Malice from earlier pops out, and then before you know it, you two are on a wagon out in the beautiful sunlight. This is probably the most jarring transition in a game that I've experienced, but it gets a lot weirder. Right away, he asks to marry Carrie. She at first says that they are too young to get married, but he eventually wears her down enough to agree to it. He lets his creepiness out again when he says, yes, very good, now we have a binding contract. She's like, what? And he's like, nothing. And then it just ends. What was that? I'm actually kind of happy I got the bad ending because it was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen and I really did not expect any of that to happen. So that counts for something. So as expected, Malice is actually Dracula. What I didn't expect though is that the Dracula I did fight was an imposter. Are you confused? Because I sure am. Overall, I went into this game expecting to hate it or find it unplayable, but it kept my interest. There were parts I enjoyed a bit, mostly in the beginning, and I appreciate the fact there were actual vampires running around and a genuinely creepy atmosphere. I liked playing as Carrie, and I found that her weapon made this a lot easier to get through than if I would have played as Reinhardt. Now all that being said, the game obviously has its problems. We all know camera angles were still finding their footing during this era, but this game really takes the cake when it comes to shitty angles. I also wish the atmospheric parts were a little more intense and that there was more music. I've always associated Castlevania games with awesome soundtracks, so it surprised me when I didn't find much music in this game. But what surprises me even more is that there are people who love this game's soundtrack. Because my ears didn't really find one. Maybe the people who talk about the soundtrack are referring to Legacy of Darkness. I don't know. If the game got remastered, I think it would have potential. But it needs a lot of work. I did try out Legacy of Darkness the other night, and so far it does seem a lot better. There's awesome music, the camera angles seem to be way less annoying, the visuals are better, and it just feels a lot more polished. I'm glad I played the first Castlevania 64 first before Legacy of Darkness, because now I can like really appreciate Legacy of Darkness. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to thank those of you who watched along during my streams, who were in the chat giving me tips, because I would not have been able to finish this game without you guys. And thank you so much for watching, and I'll be back again very soon. See you next time. Bye!